Hey everyone, let's just sit down for once with a drink and relax and maybe just watch a regular YouTube video. Uh, how about we watch something from Sargon? In Britain, and indeed the Western world in general, we see a pandemic of globalists dominating public life. These combined interests seek to erode the nation-state itself by sacrificing sovereignty and national borders. Oh, Sargon, 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 how can you be so close and yet so far away? A certain case for open borders from progressives tends to hinge on a unitary view of humanity. Yeah, it's called the Enlightenment. The political problems of the world are caused ultimately by tribalism, where a location or a religion or whatever puts people in a category of the we, and everybody else is the not-we. Evolutionary psychology teaches us that for members of the outgroup, the not-we, we turn off our empathy. One of the goals of the Enlightenment was to get people to expand their sphere of concern to all of humanity so that everyone becomes part of the we and there is no not we anymore. But better for British farmers, it would not be. As a study by the Bank of England found, and as Channel 4 fact-checked in 2016, there is certainly a depressive effect on wages by mass immigration. Funny how in his sources he doesn't actually link to this study. He links to news articles about it. Sargon, there's one thing you gotta learn. You cannot get good science reporting out of the news media. Not only that, but their link to the study isn't valid anymore, so I'm left to guess. But I think the study they're talking about is The Impact of Immigration on Occupational Wages, Evidence from Britain, from 2015. The first red flag is that this paper hasn't been subjected to peer review. Well, the second. The first is that it's from the Bank of England, and that isn't exactly an unbiased source. But the real problem is, as this study itself acknowledges, it's an outlier. And hardly any other study has come to this conclusion. You can always find one study that'll back up whatever crazy idea you want. Especially if you go outside the peer-reviewed literature. But as I showed in my video how to argue for immigration restrictions, the consensus, both from economic theory and empirical data, is that immigration is a net benefit to both employment and wages, even among the unskilled. So the relevant question, Sargon, is do you accept this outlier of a study because you've analyzed it closely and determined that it has superior methodology to pretty much all of the peer-reviewed studies that have ever been done before, which of course you will have comprehensively reviewed? Or are you accepting it merely because it conforms to what you believe? This was hand-waved away as being minor, but does not one wish to have rising wages? Not necessarily! One wishes to have better purchasing power. There's a difference. If the immigrants are working for lower wages and that lowers the prices of goods and services, then your paycheck goes further, even if the nominal amount isn't greater. In fact, even if your paycheck does fall 2%, but prices fall 3%, then you're still better off. If you're really worried about purchasing power, then you need to be complaining about inflation, not immigration. Which means the Bank of England itself is what you should be attacking. Time has vindicated those on the anti-immigration side of the argument. A year later, the Recruitment and Employment Confederation, a group that represents recruitment firms, confirmed that the Brexit referendum and subsequent net reduction of migration from the continent has indeed forced firms to raise wages. While I'm a supporter of Brexit, this point just isn't actually good enough. You need to compare what happened to wages with what happened to prices. Donald Trump tried something similar in the U.S. with steel and aluminum tariffs on the theory that this would increase jobs and wages for steel and aluminum workers. It did, but for every job it created in those industries, it destroyed 16 jobs elsewhere, according to an estimate from the Trade Partnership, because those tariffs meant that steel and aluminum were more expensive, which means the costs of all the industries that depended on them were higher, which means prices went up, sales went down, Jobs were lost, and Americans as a whole were worse off. You can't just look at this kind of thing in a vacuum, Sargon. A year after that, research showed that half of employers who'd found it more difficult to recruit have themselves raised wages. But what happened to the overall number of jobs? Are they employing as many people as they would have at the lower wage level? Basic economics says they wouldn't be. And as I said before, what about purchasing power? How many of these goods are now more expensive? 
Again, you have to look at all the variables. The pressure is on employers to not only offer an attractive salary, but also additional benefits. Which will only compound the problem. If you understand why minimum wage destroys jobs, and it does, you understand why anything that artificially raises wages destroys jobs as well. And there may be other things about Brexit that's having a positive effect on wages and unemployment, but that would be independent of the issue of immigration. The magisterium, the moral and political authority of the British state. Well, who cares about the British state? Really, I'm not being an obstinate foreigner here because who cares about the American state too? Who cares about any state? They're not the boss of my life, and they certainly aren't anyone we should look to for moral authority. Governments are supposed to be there to protect rights, not inhibit them. But what are you doing when you prevent someone from crossing a completely arbitrary line on a map drawn generally as a result of war, if not a succession of wars? Where's the moral authority there? If someone wants to hire an immigrant, and an immigrant wants to work for them, and it's a voluntary arrangement, how does any third party, government or otherwise, have any moral authority to intrude on that arrangement? As a citizen of the United Kingdom, a taxpayer, a voter, and a person who is politically engaged, I recognise the limits of the British state, and believe its primary responsibility should be to protect the rights of the citizens over which it governs. Where possible, it should advance their interests. And you don't see the contradiction here? What happens when advancing the interests of the citizens, whatever that means, can be done only by infringing their rights, not protecting them? We've seen that over and over again in history. You have to give up your individual right for this or that in order to preserve the greater good, or for national security, or to create jobs, to prevent another financial crisis. On and on and on and on and on! with an eye to increasing their prosperity, but not at the expense of certain segments of the population for the benefit of others. Do you not see how self-defeating this argument is, Sargon? You say that a certain policy will benefit the people as a whole at the expense of a certain segment. Why should that segment have greater or lesser privileges and considerations than the British people as a whole, native or otherwise? The British state has magisterium over its sovereign territory. He uses this word magisterium several times, and I have to say I find it disturbing. Magisterium means the authority and power wielded by a church to speak God's truth. Whatever the church says must be right because the church says it. So are you saying that whatever the British government says is right simply because they say it? Is that why you accepted this B of E study? Because it's some sort of papal decree? And our hypothetical Antarctic farmers would lie outside of this territory. Not once they move there. Then they are inside the territory and should be treated as equals. Maybe not given political rights like the right to vote, but they absolutely have their natural rights. Their freedom of movement, freedom to live and work and interact voluntarily with those around them. If Britain, or any other nation, takes responsibility for the citizens of another sovereign state, such as our hypothetical Democratic Republic of Antarctica, we create a political imperative that would be essentially indistinguishable from imperialism. Uh, what? It's imperialist to allow people to voluntarily move to your country to live and work? I think you need a better dictionary, Sargon. Imperialism is when a nation extends its authority outside its borders and practices hegemony in territory belonging to other nations. If anything, open borders is the opposite of that. As Professor Brian Kaplan, writing for Libertarian publication The Foundation for Economic Education, describes it in a debate in which he made the libertarian case for open borders. The government decrees that fellow human beings can't live or work here, the United States, without proper papers, papers that are almost impossible for most people on earth to ever obtain. It treats them as criminals for terrible offences like shining shoes on the streets of Miami, or picking fruit in the fields of California. If libertarians won't stand up for the rights of these literally oppressed people, we stand for nothing and we are nothing. Again, we see the imperial claim to be the protectors of the rights of those born outside our own nations. And why should it matter where they're born? That's just an accident of nature. That says nothing about what their rights are. Their natural rights are the same no matter where on the planet they're born or happen to be at the time. 
So the United States government has a directed imperative from the founding documents to respect the natural rights of everyone in its borders, regardless of where they were born. And those founding documents are based on British common law, developed in your country by hard-won battles over a period of a thousand years. And this line of logic can be extended indefinitely into a form of globalist manifest destiny. No, it can't, because it only refers to how a country can act within its own borders. It says nothing about what the country should do outside its borders. Which is nothing, by the way, unless they're attacked by a foreign military. This will be the justification for us to consider the lot of the inferior foreigner and decide that our protection of his rights will be better for him than allowing his country self-determination. So it's allowing self-determination to forcibly prevent people from crossing an imaginary line and interacting with people who would willingly interact with them? And what does it have to do with his country of origin? Immigration is about what a country does on its own territory. It says nothing about how it acts outside of its own borders. This is a complete non sequitur and an equivocation fallacy. It might be convenient for us to staff the National Health Service with Indian doctors, but why do we never consider that the time and expense of training an Indian doctor is carried by the Indian people themselves? Is it? The fact that they spent some $100,000 in tuition fees doesn't mean that they are the ones shouldering their own burden? That's a lot cheaper than it is in the US or the UK, by the way. This is the modern form of colonialism, where the West extracts human capital from developing nations in order to enrich themselves. Well, it's not like we're going over there whacking them on the head with a truncheon and dragging them back here! If Indian doctors are moving to the US and the UK seeking a better life, maybe India should be asking the question, why? And maybe our country should be asking why we're importing so many doctors when our respective licensing systems and regulatory structures arbitrarily limit the number of physicians, thereby artificially inflating their salaries, creating the demand for foreign physicians. Not even getting into all of the policies that arbitrarily inflate demand for college and thus increase tuitions. No, let's just stop people with brown skin from coming into the country. And what of the working poor of Britain? In previous eras, it might have been the job for employers to sufficiently train the unskilled at their own expense. This at once provides the company with properly trained employees and provides a ladder for the less fortunate to access the upper stratas of society. Wasn't that the very promise of this dozen-year Prussian education model the US and the UK have sentenced their respective children to? Maybe you should be looking around for the right policy to blame here. We have hideously miseducated children who then, once grown, have to seek employment at a mandated minimum wage despite having no experience, and employers should then shoulder an additional burden of training them? Focusing on recruiting from within Britain would be a way for the rich to give back to the poor that is both respectful and mutually beneficial. Class resentment would surely diminish as the poor come to see the rich as an opportunity instead of an oppressor. If you want to do that, then closing the borders is moving in the opposite direction. This can only happen in a free and open market, without restrictions on immigration, trade, wages, competition, banking, and other economic activities. The libertarian author grapples with the inconsistencies in his own argument as he attempts even to make his distinctions. Either freedom of association is absolute, in which case property must be abolished to fulfill this right. Wait, what? How do you figure that? How are you going to have freedom of association without property? Freedom of association means you invite onto your property whomever you want, and can exclude whomever you want. How can you have any freedom of association without property rights? Or freedom of association is a social right, and subject to the same restrictions we would place on our own citizens. None of our natural rights should be restricted. At all. Ever. For example, if one wishes to meet for coffee in the author's house, he is met with the border controls of the author's own front door. A front door isn't a border. This is the same false equivalence we see over and over again from the Bordertarians. There is all the difference in the world, both ethically and practically, 
from a property line delineated by someone obtaining property via the fruits of their own labor and thus giving up any other resources they might have been entitled to, the opportunity costs, and governments fighting wars to determine which river or ocean or arbitrarily drawn lines within which they get to exercise dominion. The first is determined via deontological ethics derived logically from first principles. The second is mere might makes right. Unfortunately for him, he has unwittingly consented to national borders by arguing for the protection of the property rights of those who own the property at the border, whether publicly or privately owned. Really? You don't see the blatant contradiction here? If I own property in the U.S. that borders Mexico, and my neighbor Jorge just on the other side of the border is my friend, and I want to invite him over for a barbecue, property rights says I can do that, because that action doesn't infringe on the person or property of another. He just walks from his property over to mine. A border means that, despite the fact that this is a completely peaceful, voluntary act, government nonetheless has the power to intervene by force to prevent it from happening. And it means that someone in Iowa, a thousand miles from the border, has more of a say in what I can do on my own property 50 feet from the border. Equating private property boundaries with political borders ends up giving you massive contradictions. In the case of the liberal state, Property can indeed be collectively owned. Public land and roads are for public use by the people who pay to create and maintain them, which gives the citizens of the state just cause to claim them as their own. Read up on the English common law principle of right of way. It's pretty much the only form of legitimate collective property rights there is. Since people have been using roads and pathways and whatever else through antiquity to get from point A to point B, then that particular pathway is unavailable to be homesteaded. That's how liberty of movement is preserved in a system of property rights. And you don't get to infringe on it just because you paid to have it paved! By extension, we can claim to be part owners of the entire country in which we live. No, you can't! That is blatant aggression against legitimate property owners. Sargon, you've got a lot of reading up to do on the foundations of natural rights and how they lead to property rights, and even the evolution of these rights and concepts in your own country's history. All of this is to say nothing of the manifest social problems that arise from mass immigration, which the progressive or libertarian moralist clearly does not see themselves grappling with in their wealthy, gated communities. Funny how all the libertarians I know are poor. They are happy to leave this problem to the working class people of a nation. Yeah, libertarians are all super wealthy people with monocles and handlebar mustaches who spend our days swimming in pools full of gold coins. Jeez. Who now find themselves inundated with the masses from other countries, countries to which they have never been, have no experience of, and do not understand. Isn't that a better reason to support immigration? So that we can interact with others and gain a greater understanding of different cultures? America was built on that very idea, and it became the economic powerhouse of the world. We only started having these major problems once our government started moving away from those principles. Again, this is just basic tribalism, the we and the not we, which has been the source of every major political problem throughout history, as opposed to the modern principles of the Enlightenment, which says we should expand this consideration to all human beings. How about a quote from the real Sargon of Akkad? Witness, if you so shall, the majesty of creation, the connectedness of all, was and always will be. Entanglement? No. We call it love. Your namesake understood this over 4,000 years ago. What's taking you so long? Hey, if you enjoyed this video, why not hit like and subscribe? And to make sure I can keep producing content, support this channel by becoming a patron. And check out all the other great content here, like this video selected especially for you.